Join me to Matthew chapter 4, the message that God has given me is entitled, God Rewards the Faithful. Jesus said that we're in this world, but we're not of this world as his disciples, as children of God. But because we live in this world, Satan loves to distract us to the point that he can entangle us back into the affairs of this world. And Paul said to Timothy, we're soldiers of God, and we're not to get entangled with the affairs of this world because we're to please him who has enlisted us. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at this word and see what Spirit's saying to us today. Matthew 4, let's pick it up in verse 17. From that time, so this is the beginning of something. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And still, the Lord is saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You don't know what day you're going to check out of this world. Jesus, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately, immediately noticed that, left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they too left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. That is the gospel of the kingdom. We're admonished by the Word of God to be wise as serpents, yet remain harmless as doves. That is a depiction of God's character and nature. He's wise as a serpent, but he remains harmless as a dove. If we do not allow our hearts and minds to be renewed by God's Word, like Paul tells us to in Romans 12, 1 through 3, and through the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, we can very easily fall prey to Satan's schemes and lies. And it happens more subtle and more easier than most Christians realize. I could preach on that the rest of the day. He comes up on people and just before you know it, they're scrapping with him and don't even realize it. We see in the story, or we see in the story of the fall of Adam and Eve, what happens when believers either do not know God's word as Eve did, or do not apply the word as Adam failed to do, that they know to their lives, we've got to apply God's word. We've got to get in it first, read it, and hide it in our hearts so that we do not sin against it, so that we can be protected through the word from sin. The Word will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Word. In Eve's case, Satan convinced her that God was withholding something good from her in order to grab her attention away from God and His commandments. If Satan is effective at one thing in the body of Christ, it is this, that he gets us to look at what we don't have when we look at somebody who does have it. It's not wise, Paul says in Corinthians, to... To, uh, for us to compare ourselves by ourselves. He says it's unwise. The serpent told Eve that she could be like God, knowing that she was good, that knowing good and evil, she was already like God. She was created in his image and likeness. The only way she could have been more like God was to develop her character by keeping his word. Be very aware when someone or something draws your attention to something that you do not have 
lest you give place to the deceiver to captivate your attention and pull you away from being faithful to God and cause you to sin. This is happening in epidemic proportions right now in the body of Christ. It seems that most people, both in the church and in the world, get excited when they anticipate something new taking place in their lives. Can I get a witness? We get excited when new things come into our lives, right? Perhaps this was the case in the disciples' lives as they agreed so readily and so speedily with Jesus to walk away from their careers as fishermen and they left their families to follow Jesus so that he could transform them into kingdom ambassadors. They were excited. This is something new. This is something different. And they went. Doesn't that crack you up? I mean, if somebody, walked, say I were to invite an evangelist and he came in here and he started preaching the gospel and then he walked back there to you and says, I want you to start following me and you say, honey, I'm gone. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I'm, I'm quitting my job, by the way. Do you think that rests well with the honey folk at home? You doing what? With who? Who is he? See, it was the new thing. Jesus was beginning his earthly ministry. He was launching his earthly ministry. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he was fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy where Isaiah declared that those who have sit in darkness will see a great light. According to John chapter 1, Jesus is the light of the world and that light is the life of men. Obviously, the disciples, not realizing who Jesus was, saw the light shining through him. Something drew them to Jesus. Can I get a witness? Something drew you out of the world to Jesus, was it not? There was a light that had, he had that drew you out of darkness. It was a new day for Jesus. It was a new day for the disciples. It was a new day for Israel and ultimately for the entire world as Jesus began to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. It is in the context of biblical prophecies being fulfilled and the excitement coming to those who were sick, hurting, lost, and demon-possessed, that Jesus asked the men who were cleaning their nets to leave everything behind and follow him. Now, because everything was new to these men, and they witnessed the miracles that Jesus was performing the day that he called them away from, from the things of the world, it appears that leaving was fairly easy for them, doesn't it? On the surface, it does, does it not? You get excited, and, and you're like, I want to say goodbye to the past. I want to say hello to the new thing. We do it every January the 1st. We're so excited about the new year until January 2nd shows up. And it's back to business as usual. Can I get a witness? This is just the same thing done differently. More than Jesus asking the men to leave their family and job behind, Jesus had also promised to transform these former fishermen into men who would love God and serve him with their entire life. How many realizes that excitement about something new in our lives can wear off fairly quickly once reality sets in and consumes our lives? You get excited about getting married you go on the honeymoon, and you're so excited, and then reality sets in. Honey, why is the toilet seat still up? And who told you to throw you towels in the floor? Reality starts setting in, don't it? And before you know it, the joy starts dwindling, and reality starts biting you. Can I get a witness, or are you too afraid to? The disciples agreed to leave their families and old lives behind and allowed the Lord to begin to disciple them so that they would become the men of faith that God had tended them to be from the foundation of the world. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. My son used to wear a t-shirt that says, It's all fun and games till the police show up. Christianity is all fun and games till Satan shows up. 2 Corinthians 4, let's pick it up in verse 7. This is talking about us in the body of Christ. 
But we Christians have this treasure, the Holy Spirit in us, in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side. Are we not feeling that pressure in America right now? Yes, we are. Even though we're hard-pressed, we're not crushed because we have that treasure in us. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair because that treasure is in us. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed because that treasure is in us. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We're caring about that in our bodies, y'all. The dying of the Lord Jesus. And here's why. That the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. See, we're suffering, but as we're suffering, it's just like the olives that are being crushed in the pressure of the press so that the oil can flow out of those olives and we can use the oil for various things, right? So as we are crushed for Christ's sake, the oil of God's anointing flows out of us and other people see the aroma, sense the aroma of God coming out of us as we glorify God in our bodies. Paul and Silas did that after they beat them without mercy, throw them in the inner prison after beating them, put them in chains and stocks and left them there to bleed throughout the night. But at midnight they began to sing. While their bodies were aching and hurting, and you can't imagine the pain of having the flesh ripped off your back with the cat of nine tails, and then begin to worship in that. The oil of gladness was coming up inside of them. What, the, what the, the, the people did to Paul and Silas that day did not diminish their joy. It did not cause them to lose their joy they let the joy of the Lord come up inside of them and they begin to sing psalms unto the Lord and the Lord showed up see when you give God your your best in the worst times of your life that's when God shows up and shows out on your behalf because he says I inhabit the praises of my people. And when Paul and Silas started singing unto the Lord, the presence of God's Spirit came down inside of that because he inhabited their praises. And he began to shake the foundations of the prison so that the cells burst open and all the chains fell off of all the prisoners that were in that prison because God is with us. And if he's with us, he's for us. And if we'll let the joy of the Lord shine through our hearts while we're being pressed, God will be glorified. Can I get a witness? But read on. Paul doesn't stop there. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. No wonder people don't like being Christians after they sign up for it. It's not for sissies. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Why? That the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Jesus said you'll be brought before governors and judges and, and kings, but don't, don't take to thought what you shall say because in the hour that you need it, the Spirit will give it to you so that you will have things to say and you'll be a witness to them. See, we, we, live, we who live for Christ are always delivered to death, but, but Jesus is going to shine through us, but we got to let him shine through us and not focus on what we're going through. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore we speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sakes that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God therefore he said all that to get down to verse 16 and he said therefore having said these things we Christians do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction. Don't you like that? You know Paul and Silas, they, they really had some hard hits there with the, the whipping post. Can I get a witness? Thrown into the inner prison. But he says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. It feels like it's a lot longer than a moment, doesn't it, when you're in the furnace? 
is working for us. Here's what it's doing. Because we have faith in the furnace, we have faith in the lion's den, we have faith in the courtroom, because we have faith where we, we are taken into custody, where we're taken into a fiery trial, because we take faith in there, we're taking Jesus in there, and it is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, glory has weight. And when you walk under that glory, you're going to feel the weight of the responsibility of that glory. Because glory will make you walk a straight line. While we do not look at the things that are seen. Now we're getting down there where we can really bite into it, right? We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're born of the Spirit, and we're not of the flesh. So we are not to look at the things that are seen. But what do we look at when there's trouble? Things that are seen. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are what? They're temporary, but the things which are not seen, they are eternal. At some point in every believer's life, God will let you know when it is time to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Well, I thought I made him Lord of my life when I accepted him. Mm. We can say I make you Lord. That's a big difference between saying, I do, and I will. <laughs> Not everyone who receives Jesus into their heart is willing at that point to re really make Jesus the Lord of their life indeed. Paul wrote it like this in Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. See, when God tells you to do something, at first you don't want to do it. So he says, okay, I'm going to work in you first to will it. So he puts you in a trial that will make you will to do his will. And then after he's done working on you, you'll do it. His good pleasure. It is God who works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's why things are getting a little hard on the body of Christ right now. God's working it out for us. Because he's working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory in us. See, we got to shine like Jesus in the earth. Because if we don't shine like Jesus in the earth, that stuff's going to show up before his glory in heaven when we stand before the throne. So he's got to clean us out with the refiner's fire. Can I get a witness? Do not think it strange, Paul says, I mean, Peter says, concerning the fire trials which have come upon you to try your faith. As your Lord, God will require us to do things that go against our flesh. Can I get a witness? Everything God asks us to do goes against our flesh. God will draw us out of our comfort zone and instruct us to do things for his good pleasure that can cause us to suffer for his name's sake. Anybody ever been there? For some reason, God put it in mom and daddy to want to be uh, full of the Spirit, speaking in tongue, tongue talkers around people that were de denominationally minded. And what did that cause us as a family to do? Suffer great persecution. Holy rollers called us all kinds of names, insulted us, could, ha could have nothing to do with us. It was as if we had a plague. And all it was is it was Christians that were children who were untaught by their parents about the power of the Holy Spirit because without the power of the Holy Spirit you cannot be God's children but yet they they persecute those who are spirit filled baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire with the evidence of speaking in tongues because God gets us outside our comfort zone for his name's sake and when you, when you feel with the Holy Spirit and people reject you, it's going to make you tough or it's going to make you hard. You can't get hard, then God will have to deal with you, so you just get tough. It is at this point in our walk of faith with the Lord that we have to decide. Are we going to submit to God, resist the devil, and fulfill God's purpose? Or are we going to return to our old ways when it gets hard living for God? and instead start living to please self.
That's where the body of Christ is right now. It's getting real hard. We got excited about God saving us, filling with it, us with His Spirit, and giving us a destination called heaven. We're excited that we don't have to go to hell. But when the furnace of affliction starts coming up in our lives one day after the next, after the next, after the next, we start wondering, is this really worth it? And the love of many starts growing cold. For those who choose to continue obeying the Lord after the excitement of being called out of darkness and translated into his marvelous light has gone, that we might live for God and die to self, we have to decide to also walk by faith in God. We just made a segue right there. Let me say that again. Because sometimes I slip stuff on you and you're like, where'd that come from? For those who choose to continue, anybody decided I'm going to go ahead and continue obeying the Lord even though it seems like the excitement is gone out. Now, when you make that choice, you're, you're choosing to go into that narrow place where only a few can find it and a few will stay. There was a lot of them out there in Excitementville. They were, sight, they were excited, but they, they get to that narrow place where you've got to humble yourself there ain't not many on that road. You drive like you want to. You may not see another driver nowhere for hours on that road. You feel like you lone Mohegan, the only one left standing. Am I, am I reaching anybody's nest today? So if you continue to obey God after the excitement is gone, after the joy is gone, because God is, has saved you and filled you with his spirit, and you decide you're going to go on, here's what you've got to do. But you've got to get past feelings. The just shall live by feelings. No, the just shall live by. So once we decide, I'm not in it for the feelings. I'm in it because God told me to get in it, and I'm obeying him. I got to walk by faith now. When I walk by faith, I'm walking by faith in his promises. Promises mean I ain't got it yet. But I have faith that it's going to come. That's when it gets real hard. When you start believing, you're, you're past the honeymoon stage of being saved. You're in the furnace of affliction now, and you've decided, I'm in it for the long haul. And God starts giving you promises and prophecies that are spoken over you because Paul told Timothy, do warfare over the, the prophecies that have been spoken over you. And then it starts getting really tough. Not a lot of people want to go to this place, but this is where the glory is. God rewards the faithful. See, these light afflictions, which are but for a moment, are working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen. So we're looking at things that are not seen. They're called promises of God. They're called prophecies of God. And as we walk in the faith in those things, we're waiting on God, but we're being persecuted. We're being, we're being hurt. We're being afflicted. The enemy is coming against us, and it's wearing us down. It's wearing us out. But we're walking by faith, and we do, it's getting so hard. It's like, I don't know if I can go on any further. And you start listening to your feelings and listening to your thoughts instead of holding on to those promises and doing warfare. But what you don't realize is there's glory in that furnace. When the three Hebrew men were thrown without mercy into that furnace that was heaped up seven times hotter, Jesus showed up. The glory of God showed up in that furnace. There is glory in your affliction. You can't see it, but others will see it on you. And you'll know they'll see it on you because they'll avoid you like the plague. And you thought it was your personality and the way you act. And no, it's not your personality. It's not the way you act. 
You're just another human on earth. It's the glory that you're carrying because you're choosing to suffer for Christ and they're not choosing to suffer for Christ. And the glory that's on you convicts the, the flesh that is in them. I'm going to preach right here. I said the glory in you convicts the flesh that is in them. That's why they separate themselves from you and say, excuse me, but I can't hang out with you. You too weird. It's not that we weird, it's that we from another world. As Christians decide to suffer, to obey Christ rather than please self, they are allowing the Lord to bring them into the goodness and glory of God. Yeah, he's bringing you. His goodness is going to follow me. It's going to overtake me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, David wrote. So when we decide to suffer, to obey Christ rather than please self, then we are allowing the Lord to bring His goodness and glory into our lives. When His glory shows up, affliction shows up with it. Hmm. You can bear up under the pressure of affliction. You can carry the weight of glory. Woo! Mm. Not everybody's strong enough to handle the weight of the, the, the pressure of affliction. And God says, because you can't handle the pressure of affliction, you certainly can't handle the weight of glory. Mm. But God rewards the faithful. So we keep pressing on because there's more. The fact that things, I, this is the end of the sermon. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you now in case you check out. The fact that things are intensifying in our day like we have never seen in my generation, have never seen anything like the intensity of the spiritual warfare that is going on in America, it is off the charts. They can't even chart how bad spiritual warfare and persecution is coming against Christians in America. It's not that people are dragging us out of churches and killing us like they're doing maybe over in China or over in Asia, but, but they are... Demons are coming against us, against our families, and warring at our families, and warring at each other, and we get caught up in that, and we get at each other's throats. Because it's demonic, y'all. Check yourself. We get caught up in it. See, I started out talking about that, and you don't even realize you got caught up in it. People getting caught up in it right now, at each other. Son against dad, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, daughter-in-law against father-in-law. It's happening just as Jesus said it would happen. And I think it's Matthew 10. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. How's that sword working for you guys? If you can't handle the furnace of affliction, you can't handle the glory that's coming. But if you can stand... Under the affliction. Having done all to stand. Stand therefore and wait for the glory. Because the glory is coming just as sure as you're standing under that pressure. The glory is coming. That's what makes my, 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 my heart tick right now. I know the glory is coming because the intensity of the warfare is escalating. It's getting greater. It's getting stronger. And you just have to get in that, that, that secret place and hunker down under the power of the Holy Spirit and pray without ceasing because it's going to take that to get through that level to where you can get into that place of God's glory where people start seeing God in and on you and not you. They won't be seeing us. No, they won't. They'll be seeing God. Christ in you, the hope of. You were called to glory, but before you get to glory, you've got to go through a cross. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. So when you committed to Christ, that commitment was really you saying, give me the cross. I'll take it. 
So as we decide to suffer, to obey Christ rather than play self, then we're allowing God's goodness and glory to come upon our lives. And Paul tells us this in verse 17 that we just read. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. It's working for us. The affliction is working for us. Woo, you're the master of your affliction. It's working for us because God promised in Romans 8, 28, I will work all things together. You keep your mind stayed upon him while you're in the furnace of affliction so he can keep your heart and mind. Can I get a witness? Because the intensity of the warfare comes against the mind first. For the light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's only going to be a little while, and the glory is going to come, and it's going to be exceedingly, and it's going to be eternal weight of glory. Whew. So Paul tells us about that glory in verse 17. However, in verse 18, let's read that again. While we do not look at the things that are seen. How many is looking at the things that are seen? Listening to the things that are seen. Being influenced by the things that are seen. Cut it out. But at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. They're going to come up with a new lie and a new scheme tomorrow. And the thing that they're working on you today get you all worked up. That's going to lose its fervor over you. It's going to lose its stronghold over you. So they got to go figure out something else new to throw at you. To get you all tore up from the floor up. But you got to take your eyes off of the things that are seen. Church. Or you're going to faint in well doing. But we are to look at the things that are not seen. So verse 18 is where we need to focus on for the sake of this message and our faith in Jesus Christ. If we only focus on what we're losing for Christ's sake. See, you're losing a lot of stuff because you're choosing to walk the narrow way. See, the thing about the narrow way, you can't take a U-Haul with you. Some of y'all try and take a U-Haul with you and God said no. When he called his disciples out, did he tell them to take a script and a purse and a sword and all that stuff? No, he said, you go with what's on your back, and I'll take care of you when you get there. Well, i got to take my U-Haul with me. Some of y'all use Penske, I'm sorry. I'll take my Penske with me. If we only focus on what we're losing, and we're, and we're doing that right now, we're losing a lot of stuff right now. We're losing our, our stronghold, our fortress in America. We're seeing it erode away from us. And people are calling this a post-Christian nation. They don't know we, got, we ain't gone. We just asleep. When, when God wakes up this sleeping giant, they will know this is still a Christian nation. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all is coming back. I said it's coming back. What the enemy stole from America, Christians who are born again, full of the Holy Ghost, they're going to say enough is enough. As for me and my house, we're going to take it back. You just got to get enough of their junk. Some of y'all been on junk food too long because the meat of God's Word was too strong for you. So God's got to wean you off their junk. Oh, we had it better in Egypt. Their leeks and their onions. God had to wean them of that. Gave them manna. You know the meaning of manna is? What is it? Again, we're having manna again. Yes, and you'll have it again and again till you're broken of saying, are we going to have this again? Suck it up, buttercup. This is your diet now. Because God's going to teach us on manna how to enjoy the good stuff when it comes. Because if you ain't humble enough to appreciate manna versus starving, you ain't going to appreciate the vineyards that are in the promised land, the wells you didn't dig, the houses you did not buy, the houses you did not build, the land you did not own. And I'm going to give it all to you. But if you want to complain about the manna, you're going to stay there in Manaville. (laughs) 
I don't have a gear called stuck in my transmission. I'm sorry. It's either drive or broke. They used to have this little cardboard sign they put up on their little VW bus when they leave Mineral Bluff. Say, California or bust? Heaven or bust? So we have to focus on what we will gain through Christ instead of what we're losing in the flesh right now. Then we'll have joy, and the joy of the Lord will become our strength. Whew. See, see, people think joy is a feeling. Joy is not a feeling. Joy is a fruit. And you ain't going to bear no fruit except there be a little pain. Trees have to go through a lot of junk to bear fruit. And not every tree will bear fruit. They got to be a fertile tree. They got to have the capability of producing fruit. God says, unless you abide in Christ Jesus and he abides in you and his word abides in you, you'll have no fruit. But if you abide in him and he abides in you and his word abides in you, you're going to bear much fruit. Then he's going to prune you. Every time we think we're getting somewhere, God prunes us. So if we start focusing on what we're gaining in Christ, are y'all there? Are you got to the point in your maturity in Christ where you say, you know what, I've got to quit uh, looking at what I'm, I'm not getting. I'm not getting my satisfaction. I'm not getting my fix. I'm not getting my fulfillment. I'm not getting my what want to's d- taken care of. So I'm going to focus on what I'm about to get. Then we'll have joy, and that joy will be our strength. So joy has got to come into the house of God because God rewards the faithful. He's not going to forsake us just because we're going through the furnace of affliction worse than we've ever gone before does not mean that God has forsaken us. It means that God's sitting down on top of us. (laughs) Hebrews 12. Verse 1. Therefore, there it is again. When you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. Read verse, chapter 11, you'll find out what the therefore is there for. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those mentioned in chapter 11 who, who believed but did not see the promise fulfilled, we surrounded by them. Let us, Christians, in America especially, lay aside every weight and the sin which so in, in easily ensnares us. That's why Christians faint too easily. They're not willing to let the weight and the sin of their past go. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. But while you're running this race, y'all, keep Jesus in mind. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the, 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 the beginning of our faith and the completer of our faith, who for the joy, see, there's the joy. He didn't get his joy in this world. He got suffering in this world. But he looked beyond this world. When you look beyond this world, you're going to see the joy that's coming. For he looked to the joy that was set before him, endured the, the cross, despising the shame. So you've got to look ahead. You've got to look to the eternal or you're going to faint in the natural. Who for the joy set before him endured the, the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you, Christian, become weary and discouraged in your souls. This is why we're, we're getting weary and discouraged, because we think the only one, we're the only ones going through what we're going through. Jesus has already gone through it many times more worse than any of us will ever go through it. Have you, or you have not resisted to bloodshed, have you, striving against sin? No, but he did. Amen? Getting quiet in this church. So Jesus was God in flesh. He was God made man. And he he had to concentrate on the joy that was set before him. And he was God. If Jesus was God and he had to set his, his scope on the things that were before him, in eternity, then guess what we got to do? We too, humans, need to constantly remind ourselves to focus on the eternal and the invisible world that is to come lest we grow weary and discouraged and quit our faith walk. Many are doing that. They're saying, I'm saved, but they're not moving forward. 
The just shall walk. The just shall what? Walk. Did it say the just shall sit by faith? I mean, the just? Does it say that? The just shall sit by faith. We are to walk. It's motion, y'all. It's action. Faith without works is what? You're welcome. Going back for Christians should never be an option. But many have and continue to go back. No longer serving, but only waiting. COVID caused a lot of people to hang up their walking shoes. What they're doing is sitting at home on the premises instead of standing in the church building on promises. Somebody need to help me preach this right now because the, the, the attendance of churches around this nation, especially mega churches, have been plummeting since 2020. The government made an excuse. God did not. The government made an excuse for Christians to stay at home and forsaking the fellowship with other believers, which, Paul, which the writer of Hebrews warns us don't do that, as some have done. We have to remind ourselves to focus on the eternal. So, whenever we don't, so many are no longer serving God. They're just waiting, doing nothing to further the kingdom of God or to spread the good news of the gospel to the lost. Just waiting. What a miserable life that could be. When God is in you, walking should be your first nature. Run this race, the Bible said. I'm giving you a break, y'all, talking about walking. He's talking about running. Since the joy of the Lord is our strength, now more than ever, we need to keep our heart's attention on the Lord. We need to keep our attention on His promises, what He has prophesied over us and what He's spoken out of His Word for us as the body of Christ, and focus on His will so that we can fulfill the purpose that God has placed us here on the earth to fulfill. When Jesus said in Luke 18, when I return will I find faith on the earth. That's how bad it's going to get, and that's how bad it's getting right now. As a Christian, knowing that you're not going to suffer in eternal torment while being separated from God, from God for eternity, that should give you joy to overcome this world. But we still get discouraged, don't we? It's like heaven is not enough to encourage us. Right? You know why? We're in the nasty now now. So what we do is we've got to look at how good it's going to be. And let that give us joy to endure what we're having to go through. See, now, now God is faithful. To the, uh, God is, uh, will reward those who are faithful. That's the, the title of this message. So God is with us. He's for us. And he's more than the world against us. It's that we've got our attention on too much of the world, not enough on God. And it's making us feel like we're the defeated. We're not. We are more than conquerors. So if you are striving to live for God, are y'all okay? I don't want to wear y'all out. If you are striving to live for God and to serve His good pleasure, but the joy of your salvation has dissipated because of the things that you are currently enduring, this message is for you from the heart of your Heavenly Father. He literally birthed this in my spirit while I was in prayer for today's uh, service. In a moment of time, he showed me how many of y'all are just plumb worn, slap out from what you've had to go through and endure. He said, tell them reward is inevitable. Just as consequences are inevitable for the sinner that refuses Jesus Christ, reward is inevitable for the faithful Christian. God is not man that he should lie. Somebody give God praise in this house. I said, God is not man that he should lie. So we're suffering a little bit. 
So we're suffering for a little while. Can you imagine when the glory of God comes down inside of us and gets in the church house to work? People are so drawn that they drive by and the Spirit of God grips their heart and they turn in here and they say, the Spirit of God got a hold of me on the highway because the glory of God is in this house. Oh, we ain't much yet, but neither was Gideon's army. It's not about quantity, it's about quality, baby. I'd rather have a little church that kicks off the gates of hell than to have a big church that is letting hell live in their living room. You might want a copy of this this week to remind you of what you clapped about today. So if the joy is, is losing its strength in your life because you're going through the furnace, then guard your heart. If sorrow and pain have seemingly replaced the joy of the Lord that you once had in your relationship and service to the Lord, you need to have your faith re-energized by God's Word and Spirit. That's what he's doing right now. He's literally reju rejubilating. Re re he's energizing you. <laughs> Rejuvenating, yes. If you think it's easy, come on up. All right, we're almost done. 30 more minutes. God is a debtor to no one. That's Scripture, isn't it? If he asked you, oh, this is so good. I'm going to drink to it. God's a debtor to no one. If he asked you to give up anything for his namesake, or he requires you to suffer for his namesake, know that the Father will repay you. See, some of y'all suffering because God's taking things out of your life that you want left in your life, left alone. Like the Gadarenes. Don't be a part of the Gadarenes. Jesus sets a demoniac free that has an entire legion of demons inside of him. So many demons that when he cast them out, they pleaded with Jesus that they would, he would not send them into the abyss, but would let them go into the swine. And so they went into the swine. The swine run off a cliff. Why is it that pigs can't handle demons, but people can? They went into the, the, the deep and drown themselves to get the demons out of them. Then the Gadarenes show up, who are making a living off of their pigs, and it says, get out of here, Jesus. They lost their livelihood, getting a demoniac free. What was their focus on the things of this world? They were a part of the tribe of Gad, but because they didn't go over, they stayed over here. They took up pork, pork bellies. They invested in pork bellies. So, if he asked you to give up anything, he's going to repay it. He's not just going to repay it. The Bible says he repays it with interest. He will give us even greater if you'll keep sowing into his kingdom. Keep sowing, keep coming, keep doing, keep obeying, because the harvest is coming. And because the, the persecution is great and intense, the harvest is going to be even greater. God has God not promised to us that we will see things that eyes not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. God's going to do it in this house and in the nations of the world, because that is what he has promised us. He said, ask of me, and I will give to you the nations of an, as an inheritance. That is one of our key scriptures in this ministry. We are asking God for the nations. So keep sowing into his kingdom. Now, Romans 8, 13. That, now, you didn't get the way you got in, in a couple of hours, did you? So don't expect me to get you out of it in a 30-minute sermon. That was me buying time, brother. 
Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will what? You don't want to do that, Christians. We're in it, we're not of it. But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh or the body, you will live. So that's what we're doing. We're putting to death the deeds of the flesh so that we can live. We can be free, right? For as many as are led by the, 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 the government, the media, Hollywood, Twitter, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. We don't have fear. It's of the devil. But you receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. No religion has the Holy Spirit. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. And Christianity has the spirit of adoption. That's relationship. Whereas we are children of God, He is the Father. That's relationship, right? So Christians are the only ones on the earth that have evidence that we are born again because the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Since He bears witness that we are children of God, then we are heirs. Not heirs of mom and daddy. We're heirs of God. He owns the hill, the camel, and everything that's on the hill and up under the hill. And we're joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we what? Oh, man. Yes. That dreadful word, suffer. But look at it this way. If you're suffering with him, you shall also be glorified together with him. For I reckon that the sufferings of this world, this present time, are not worthy. Here it comes again. To be compared with the glory which shall be revealed where? In us. The glory is in us. This earthen treasure, this, this treasure is in the earthen vessel, is it not? That glory is coming up inside of us. So there is a glory that is hidden in us as children of God. I got to thinking about that. It says don't hide your light. But here's the problem. How many's ever taken a candle out into a windstorm? The wind will blow it out. So guys got smart and they said, we'll put the candle inside something. So they put it inside of a pottery base. The only problem is it wouldn't shine through the pottery. So they said, we'll put holes in the pottery so the, the light will shine out and the air can't blow out the candle. So what God does is he, he puts his glory in this earthen vessel. But this vessel is like an earthen pottery that won't let the light shine out. So he's got poke holes in us. And so eventually he gets us so transparent, we're like glass lanterns. And the glory is going to shine out of us like the noonday sun. So the glory is hidden in us as children of God. If we will crucify self by living for and obeying the Lord, God will perfect us and his glory will shine through us and upon us as his servants. As we suffer for Christ's sake, how many suffering for Christ's sake? Now, now you're not being drugged out of the church like I said. You're not being uh, kicked off your job and, and shot because you're a Christian. But you keep obeying God even though it seems like he's forsaken you. That's suffering for Christ's sake. Though God slay me, yet I will trust him, Job said. He kept suffering for God's sake. As we suffer for Christ's sake, we will also be allowed and empowered to partake of his glory. That should really light your fires right now. You're going to be carriers of his glory. All those that scoffed at you and, and turned their noses up at you and cut their ties with you, they're going to watch you shine like a lightning bug. Choosing, choosing to suffer in this world for the cause of Christ means that we love him more than self. Faith works best through love. By doing this, we are allowing the nature of Christ to shine through us, and people will see his glory in us instead of our flesh shining through us. Got to get the flesh out so the light can shine. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father. What you do for God will make them look to God. The only way to truly allow the light of God to shine through us is to die to self and what it wants and serve God's good pleasure. We're almost there. Hang on. If life has gotten so tough, and obviously it has, or God would not have given you this message today, that you're at the point of giving up on your faith, continue listening to this message from God that he has sent tailored-made just for you. 
Besides God allowing us to share in his glory as we die to self and suffer for his namesake, we also have the promise that God is a debtor to no one, like I said earlier. He will repay us for everything that we have sacrificed to serve his will. We kept the faith in the furnace. And because we did, God's going to reward us. Matthew 5, this is for somebody in other nations. It's, it's relevant to everybody, but it's particular for people in other nations. Matthew 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that's what many Christians practice today. But I say to you, Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, persecute you, that you what? That you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So if we, if we pray for those who, who uh, hate us and despitefully use us and say all oh, manner of evil against us and persecute us for his namesake, if we pray for them and we show them love, all we're doing is being who God called us to be. Nothing more. We're just being who God is in us. Love, right? For believers who are suffering persecution for Christ's sake and you're growing weary, whatever nation you're catching this in that you're being persecuted, to the point of giving up, remember that Jesus calls you blessed. Blessed are you. You are blessed. They don't like it because you're blessed. When people hate you and say all manner of evil against you for Christ's sake, you are blessed and you're not cursed. But because people reject you and talk and say all manner of evil against you, you take it personally. And you think you're cursed. You're not cursed. They are. How can good water and bad water flow out of the same vessel? It can't. So if they're cursing you, you're not cursed. They are. No amount of spiritual persecution or being cursed by people who hate on you can stop God from blessing you. It can't happen. You are blessed, and there is nothing Satan can do to stop that blessing from being on your life unless he can stop you from doing what God tells you to do. Matthew 19. Now back to y'all. Just bear with me a little bit longer. Matthew 19, 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you. Now, let me give you full context of this. There was a rich man came to Jesus, and his focus was on being good and doing good. And he said, What good thing, Master, should I do that I may in, uh, have, receive eternal life? And Jesus gives him a list of things. And he says, Oh, I'd, I've done those since I was a little kid. And Jesus says, Well, well take what you have. He was rich, filthy rich. And uh, give it away to the poor. Come follow me and you'll have eternal life. And he walked away sorrowful. And in the context text of this, uh, Jesus starts teaching. Verse 19, I mean verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because their trust is in their riches. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That is a place in, in Israel where uh, camels have to humble themselves to go through and to come out on the other side than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because rich people don't want to humble themselves. When the disciples heard it, when the disciples heard it, oh Oh, oh. They carrying some luggage. See, you thought when they left their houses, their lands, their wives, their families, their children, their livelihood, they thought you thought they were all happy and excited, right? They not saying much. But Jesus uses this rich man's occasion to deal with something that's buried in their heart that they're not talking about. God knows how to bring stuff out of us we didn't know was inside of us. Mm. Don't you love God? 
And when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, most assuredly, you can stake your life on what I'm about to tell you is what Jesus said. Assuredly, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left, that's y'all, houses, Brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, or children are lands for my name's sake. Not because you're poor with your financial standing, but because you did it for Christ's sake, shall receive a hundredfold in this life and inherit eternal life. Now, should that rich man had stayed there to hear what Jesus told his disciples, but he got offended, his feelings got hurt. That Jesus asked him to give something he wasn't willing to give. To get something he couldn't buy. He walked away. Had he stayed, he would have heard it's going to come back. See, God don't take stuff from us. God don't let us go through the torments of hell with demonic oppression and attacks against us just to watch us burn. He says, if you'll stand, glory's coming up in your life. And when the glory and this trial passes, then the glory intensifies. When you come out, you'll come out with double portion. Now, it doesn't always mean you'll come out with double portion like Job did, but you come up out of uh, that thing with a double portion of anointing and authority so that the enemy, the demon and devils of hell, recognize that authority that is on your life. You're not coming out of that the way you went into it. And you're not going to come out less than Then you went into it. Even though you lost things when you went through it, God's going to give it back to you. Greater. Because God rewards the... He would have given that rich man everything back that he sold, plus what he wanted that he couldn't buy was eternal life. He would have had that too. I stated it before and I will repeat it now. God is a debtor to no one, and that proves it right there. You're going to get it back a hundredfold. That make you want to give. That make the Grinch want to give. Even his heart grew three three sizes bigger. (laughs) Scripture confirms to us that God will repay what we've given up for his namesake with interest. He will give back more than you could possibly ask or imagine. See, that, that's what fuels my fire right now. Because I know I'm faithful in the affliction. I'm, I'm going to wait until the day God lets me be faithful in the, the glory. But you have to stay submitted to God in the process and do not give place to your flesh or Satan and quit. Don't quit, y'all. Get another breath, square up your shoulders, and keep going. So he told me, as I was praying, there were many on the brink of giving up and going back, just sitting on the sidelines. You don't want to, but it's like that's the only option you have. He said, don't. He told me to tell you, hold on, because his reward for you is going to be far greater than anything that you're currently going through or have given up to serve him. Many of you have agreed in previous services by the showing of hands that in recent years you have witnessed a significant increase in persecution against yourself through the trials that you have had to endure. Y'all have shown that many times. Walking by faith and living for uh, for God is growing increasingly more and more difficult for those who are willing to pay the price because we are getting closer and closer to our reward. When it looks like you're at the point of despair, you're at the point of feeling forsaken, that's when God shows up. When you're at that breaking point, that's when God breaks through. Jesus is coming soon, and you, you and I need to be ready to meet him. 
That's why he's getting us ready. Why do you think everything has changed so much in the last 40 years in America? We had the lap of luxury, y'all. We had it going on. Everything was going our way. We could build anything we want. We could do anything we want. We could buy anything. Well, some of us could. And God said, that's it. It's time for y'all to be weaned off the leeks and the onions and grow up because glory's coming. Why do you think everything that can be shaken is being shaken right now? Glory is coming. It's coming on the church. The glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house. Hebrews 11. I've only got 10 more scriptures and I'll be done with you. Ask Steve Williams, he'll tell you. Rodney Howard Brown preached three hours before he clears his throat. Y'all, y'all good. <laughs> Hebrews eleven twenty nine, I mean 39. Now, he's, the writer has listed all these people who have suffered Im imaginable horrors in their life, but they kept the faith. No matter what they went through, they kept the faith. And all these, verse 39, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. I thought you said God rewards the faithful. He does. Do not grow weary in well-doing, well for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Their due season had not come because the Spirit had not yet been poured out. God having prov uh, provided something better for us under the new covenant that they under the old covenant should not be made perfect apart from us. So they all died by faith waiting on the promise that never came. The point of reading that is they never stopped believing. The only way the Father can repay us for all that we have given up for his namesake is if we continue to live by faith and serve him. You got to stay instant in season and out of season. Don't give up. Don't quit. Because if you check out and sit on the sideline, you are forfeiting your promises. You're aborting your promises. Be like the saints of old that are listed in chapter 11 who endured even though they never received the promise. You will be eternally glad that you remain faithful to the Lord in this day and time when you hear a well done, thou good and faithful servant. He's not going to say that to the unfaithful, only the faithful. Well done. To be well done means you've done something. All rise.